Uh, well, if you were with us last week, you know we kicked off a new uh, series. We are in this series called The Promise. We're going through the life of Abraham. And last week, we uh, jumped into what is one of the most crucial, important moments uh, historically in all of the Bible. So prior to last week, we had been looking at uh, 11 chapters worth of big, meta, mega things happening in the life of uh, uh, the world, really. You have the creation account. You have uh, the fall of man. You have the spreading out of man across the nations. You have a flood. You have, you have uh, before all that, the promise of God that he's going to set all things right by sending the seed of a woman to, uh, uh, to crush the head of the serpent. You, so, and then you've got the flood. You've got the Tower of Babel. You've got the nations being scattered. All of these big mega things. And then all of a sudden in chapter 12, we zoom in. The camera zooms in and focuses in on just one man and his little family family tree, Abram and his family. And it's going to be like that for the rest of the book of Genesis. That's, uh, that's where we're at. God interrupts this man, Abram's life. Abram was a moon worshiper out in Ur of the Chaldeans and, and God grabs him and he makes him his and he calls him into relationship. And if you were with us last week, you saw in verses one through three, he looks at him and he says, basically, hey, you follow me and I am committing that I'm going to change your life and I'm going to change the life of every life, your life touches. And he promises them three big things. So if you remember from last week, he looked at Abram and he said, I'm promising you land. There's a land that I have in store for you that I'm going to have you live on. I'm going to take care of you and that's coming for you. He promised him a people that you are going to produce a line of people that are going to outnumber the stars, outnumber the sands on the seashore. And then he promised him blessing that through your line, through those people, one of those people one day will be a blessing to the whole world. I'm going to bless the whole world through you, Abraham. Those were the three big things that he promised him. Land, blessing, and people. And Abraham hears this promise and it blows his mind. And he's a big yes and amen to it. So he, he changes his whole course of action. He grabs his crew and he starts moving his crew down to the land of Canaan, which was occupied at that time by a pagan nation called the Canaanites. And right there in the, the midst of this nation that wanted nothing to do with his God, he plants the flag of faith. And he says, I'm with Yahweh. I'm with this God who chose me from, from everybody else on the face of the earth. And he establishes a new uh, walk with God. Right here in verse 7, it says this, he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. So this is the great moment for Abram. This is the, uh, this is the, the zenith of his life to this point. He's, he's newly saved, just met God. I'm following you, come hell or high water. Wait, no, though none go with me, I still will follow, right? This is, if you want to think about Abram in this little season of his life, this is, he's every new baby Christian ever, right? That's, that's who Abram is right now. Do you remember those days when you just got saved? For me, it was in high school, right? And you meet, you meet the Lord and everything changes. Your mind's blown, your heart's blown, and you're just, you're all in, right? And you're just calling up all your friends and just asking them to come to church with you and you're, I'm burning all my CDs, you know, take that chumbawamba. You're just sticking it to the man, right? I'm, I'm God's man now. I'm going to every church camp I can find, just singing, I'm never going to sin again, right? That is, that's like that new Christian thing, that new, I'm, I'm just met him and my life's been changed and I'm all in. It's a beautiful moment. And that's, that's the moment that Abraham finds himself in. It's, he's a baby believer. He's on fire for the Lord. This is a special time. And if we stopped at verse 9, uh, that's how it would be for him. It'd just be this up and to the right sort of trajectory. But it doesn't stop at verse 9. There's always a verse 10, right? It never stops at church camp. It's the bus ride home, right? <laughs> and then there's the uh, showing up in your neighborhood again and in your school again with those friends again and those temptations again and now you're back in your house again in your bedroom again with those old addictions and those old struggles just waiting for you and all of a sudden you come off the mountain and you're colliding back again with real life and there's a real world you got to face that that's where Abraham's at right now he's about to collide back with that real world and that faith that was so easily available for him just seconds ago now he, he's he, it's being tested by some really scary stuff all of a sudden because in our passage today we meet uh, the first obstacle uh, to his faith and it shows up in verse 10 it says now there was a famine in the land now uh, 
you should probably circle that word famine because that idea in the scripture is a huge idea. It's not just a little weird factoid that Moses is giving us here. There's only a few sentences like that in the Bible and they're always showing up at these crucial kind of hinge moments. It is, a famine is in many ways the, the, the mechanism God uses to move his people and his storyline uh, Along. So think about the book of Ruth, for instance. The book of Ruth it, uh, opens with there was a famine in the land, and God uses this famine to, to shift some things with Ruth and her family to move that story along. In just a handful of chapters, we're going to see another famine shows up in the life of Abraham's son, Isaac. And, uh, you know, lest we forget, it, it's a famine, right, that ultimately gets Abraham's great grandchildren out of Canaan and down into Egypt where the Exodus story unfolds. So famines are a huge deal. They're, they're incredibly uh, pivotal to the plot of the scripture and to God's agenda. And they're, they're a terror. I mean, it's a, it turns out you need food to live, right? And when that's not there, it doesn't go well for you. And, and so that's the, the situation that Abram's facing as he looks up after his sort of, you know, camp time with the Lord. He looks up and he's got a famine problem, but it's not just a, it's not just any old famine. It's not a, just a food problem he has. He really has a theological problem, doesn't he? Because this is a famine taking place where? In the land that, what, five verses earlier, God told him, this is your land. I'm going to take care of you here. This is what I'm giving to you. And all of a sudden, Abram looks up and the land that God promised to him is unlivable. Like you can't be there anymore. And like, what do you do? Right? The, the, God, what God said and what Abram sees, they aren't matching up. And there's a tension that he's now living in that he wasn't living in before. Have you felt this before, right? It's like that, uh, it, it's that feeling where it's like, God, I, uh, I know you promised to meet my needs, but it is the first of the month. I need about 1,500 needs met uh, from you, and what's, well, I don't know what to do. Or God, I, I know you promise, you promise to, to give me the, the love and the patience and the, the kindness I need to love my spouse, but have you met him? Right? Like, do you know who we're working with here? Like, this is a, this is a rough go right here, though you've said a thing. Or God, I know you promised to satisfy me. You promised to satisfy me, but that still looks good. And I still want it, and I'm still tempted, and I'm still addicted, and I'm still struggling. And, and what we're experiencing in that moment is that cognitive dissonance of, I know what you've said, but I also know what I'm seeing. And we're living in this tension all of a sudden. What do you do when camp's over? Right? What do you do when the, when the high is gone, when the promises of God meet reality? That is where we find Abram in Genesis chapter 12. If he's heard the promises, but now he's seeing the problems. And he's got to choose between faith or fear. Will I cling to what God says or will I cling to what I see? Uh, and spoiler alert, uh, today in our Abraham journey, uh, it's not the former. He's going to cling to what he sees. What we're going to do over the next minutes together is we're just going to watch this snapshot of this man's life where fear is going to win out over faith for a little while. And this is important for us. This is, this is um, formative for us. We need to watch this unfold. We need to watch what life looks like when fear takes over. And that's what Abram's moment right here is going to show us. We, we want to see today what that looks like like when fear takes over, what God's going to do about it. And if there's a way back home, is there any way to make it back? Have we gone too far? What's the return like? How do I get there? That's where we're going. So if you have your Bible, it'd be good for you to get it out so you can see this with me. We're going to uh, be in verse 10 right now. The scary thing has happened. The famine has come onto the promised land. What does Abram do? Verse 10 tells us this. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was severe in the land. I think this is Abram's first mistake. Now, I don't want to throw him under the bus too hard because the text doesn't tell us outright this was a sin for him to go to Egypt. There was no statement like that. But I do think there's some yellow flags that if we're careful and we observe the text, we might be able to see it. For instance, this is an argument from silence, but it does not say after the famine comes that he brought this before the Lord, that he consulted with God. It says something scary came and he pivoted and did a thing. So, 
that's maybe not the strongest case, but I do think it's a yellow flag. You would, you would think that it would say something about him inviting God into this wrestle and this tension, but instead he, he bails. But more than that, I think what's interesting is the word Moses uses when he writes this. He says that Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. Now that word sojourn, I don't know how many folks are sojourning out here, you know, right now, but uh, uh, the word sojourn uh, does not so much mean in this context um, vacation, right? That's not what the Hebrew word's capturing. The, the idea in the Hebrew with this word sojourn is something more like immigrate. It's the word that you would use to describe a foreign person moving to a new land and planting down roots. Abram's looking to stay. That's what that word means. He's, he's digging in. And now all of a sudden it feels like a little ickier. Now Now it's not just we're just going to wait this out. Now it's like this may be where we are. We, are. we are pivoting big time. At the first sight of difficulty, he decides to relocate his whole life outside of the parameters of God's promise without consulting God. That's what I see when I read that. I think there's some yellow flags there. This is what fear does. Isn't it? The, Fear awakens in us this impulse towards self-preservation. And that's really what's happening in his heart right now. I'm afraid, so I've got to control my surroundings. I've got to figure out my situation, and I've got to do that even over the will of God. And we know this is what fear does in us. The Bible has told us this. Remember uh, Psalm 37, 8, when David's writing? He says, do not fret, it leads only to evil doing." Isn't that interesting that, that when David's thinking about fear and anxiety, he's saying to, to embrace anxiety and fear and then to walk in it, it actually produces in your life evil things. Like for you to live out of fear will only generate wickedness in your life. That's a big statement, but that's what the text is saying here. And, and we, we feel this. We feel temptations we didn't even know we would ever have on the other side of fear. So for instance, uh, you're afraid of what it would be like to be unhappy for the rest of your life with this person that you, you tethered your life with those years ago. You're looking at your spouse and you're just, you're feeling the fear of, is this how it's always going to be? And now all of a sudden, fear pushes me to a thought I never had before. It's the, the divorce comes on the table for me in a way that I never thought I would be considering beforehand. Right? Or maybe you're a student. And uh, you know you're about to bomb this test. You know you're going to bring this to your parents and they're just going to let you have it, right? And so fear takes that. It turns it into this self-preservation. Now all of a sudden this thing you never thought before, this, this prospect of cheating comes online for you because you're like, well, I mean, what recourse do I have? I have to protect myself. It's all about self-preservation. This is what fear does in us. Or maybe for you, you're single and you're getting older. And Mr. Wright, Mrs. Wright hasn't come along yet. And you're feeling a type of way like, is this ever going to happen for me? Right? And, and that fear starts creeping in. Am I going to be that spinster person out there? No? And so all of a sudden that bar gets a little lower for you and a little lower for you and a little lower for you. And then one day you look up and you've tethered your life with a person who really wants nothing to do with the God that you say you love. And you find yourself in a position you, you never thought you would actually be in. This is self-preservation. Fear leads to self-preservation, leads to acts of evil. This is how it works in a human's life. And here's the problem, one of many, with decisions made out of fear, not faith. They tend to, do you know this? They tend to um, come in bundles. They tend to snowball into more bad decisions. One tends to lead to another. So this is what happens right here in the text. Look at verse 11. It says this. When he, Abram, was about to enter Egypt, so he's now left Egypt. He's sojourning now, coming down to Egypt. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you're my sister, that it will go well with me because of you. And that my life may be spared for your sake. Okay, can we agree we're officially in red flag territory? No, right? We're, we're out of the vague. This is when you sell your wife to a pagan king, that's probably when things go downhill for you, right? But that's, that's where Abram finds himself. It, uh, decision one gets him to Egypt. Good, bad, maybe it was a bad decision. But decision one got him to Egypt and now he's got a new problem. The new problem is, I got a hot wife. 
We all bear our burdens, people. We all got to wrestle. The struggle's real. She's attractive, and I know what's going to happen. I'm going to roll into town, and it happens every time. All eyes go on her. All the leadership wants her. She's so beautiful, and this terrifies me because they're going to kill me to get to you. So, baby, will you scheme with me? Will you help me save my life by putting yours in jeopardy? If you really love me, you would, right? <laughs> Red flag. Red flag. Don't do it, boys. By the way, um, at this point in our story, uh, Sarai is 65. So I just want to take a, a side moment to say, good for you, girl. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what kind of skincare program you're on, but that is, uh, that's an amazing thing. Proud of you. Good genes. This is what happens, though, right? Bad decisions, they have a way of breeding more bad decisions, don't they? And so that one day before you know it, you find yourself stuck in a harder spot than you were before. My dad, when he was a boy, owned a BB gun. And he went to the backyard with his BB gun to shoot his BB gun. Now, back in the day, uh, the BB gun, some of them had uh, caps on the end of the muzzle, right? And you would twist it off, you'd pour the BBs in, and that's how you fire. So he's in the backyard uh, trying to get this cap off, and he can't. So he does what any person who can't get a cap off with his hands does. He takes the muzzle and he puts it in his mouth, and he kind of gives it a tw twist. What? And uh, except his hands aren't up here, one's down here, and, uh, and his thumb slips. And my dad shoots a BB into the tip of his tongue, and it goes all the way back to the back of his tongue. It is there to this day. It's the coolest party trick ever. The grandkids love it. You can feel it. I wouldn't recommend it. Bad decision number one. Fair? Uh, but now you got a new problem, because uh, you have parents. And turns out parents don't like when you shoot yourself in the face with a BB gun. It's not a it's not going to go well for you. And he knows this. And that problem's compounded by the fact that mom just made hot stew for dinner. But my dad had resolve. He was committed. Uh, he couldn't reveal. And so he, uh, dinner, dinner time comes and he sits down. And this, this boy, who really became a man at this moment, uh, <laughs> ate the, the piping hot soup for about 10 or 15 minutes. He's just grinning and bearing it like, this is fine. I love blood soup. This is really good. Uh, and it was right at the time, right before he blacked out, that his mom realized he was sweating. What's going on? I shot myself in the face. Oh my gosh. And they're in the hospital. Okay. Here's the point. Uh, bad decisions snowball. Yeah. They snowball. Abram is in a hot soup moment right now, y'all. That's what's happening with our man, Abram. Because when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Abram's wife was abducted to be another man's wife. Do you think that when Abram was back in Canaan, in the famine, he ever thought he would be selling his wife to a pagan king. Did that ever cross the guy's mind? There's not a chance. That's not what he's thinking. He's just thinking, dang, there's no more food. I got to do something, right? It was one small decision of fear instead of faith. I pivot, I run, go away. I've got a new problem. I've got to solve that one. I've got a new problem. I've got to solve that one. And he looks up and he's just abandoned the land God promised him and he's wifeless. So look at this at this moment. He's now in a foreign country without his bride, which means he is landless, peopleless, and blessingless. The three things that God promised Abram just a few verses earlier, when Abram got his hands on him, he tanked the whole project. It's all underwater because of this impulse to protect himself. What is God going to do with this man? That's what you should be feeling in this moment. You had one job and you blew it in like nine verses. If I was God, I'd be looking for Lot real quick, right? It's time to pivot. Abram, you had a good run. You're a sweet guy. But uh, where's your nephew? That's what I'm thinking. What's God going to do? Is he going to crush him? 
He's going to send fire from heaven to bring him down. Well, I'll tell you what the text actually tells us exactly what God does to him. We're going to read it on the screen together. Bring it up for me. I'll read it with you. Here we go. But the Lord afflicted Abram and his house with great plagues because of Sarai. For after all, Abram had it coming. Lousy bum. (laughs) No. Oh, no. Um. No, I'm so, uh, can we, we got the, I'm sorry guys, that's not it. What? Oh, here we go. But the Lord afflicted who? Fair, the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So that I took her as my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him and they sent him away with his wife and all he had. So just hold, okay, just recap. The bad guy in the story is Abram. Abram doesn't get cursed by God. Abram, the guy who ruined everything, like made 90 bad decisions, Gets blessed by God. The Lord afflicts Pharaoh. Abram walks out of Egypt with his wife and all his stuff. And more stuff than he had when he got there. After sinning against the one and only God. That's what that text just said. That's not fair. If you don't feel that, you're weird. It's not fair. Right? This is... When, when we read that, the impulse in every human heart is to go, what on earth? It shouldn't say Pharaoh. That's not the name that should be there. It should say the guy who operated out of fear from the jump. But it doesn't say that. It is so hard for us to compute this. We live in a world, don't we, of paybacks. That is the, that is the air we breathe, y'all. Paybacks and karma and let them have it. This is... This is This is the ethos we're in. Justin Timberlake taught me this, right? When Britney broke his heart, what'd he write? What goes around, goes around, goes around, comes all the way back around. It's a dope song, but, but what's he saying? You hurt me. Hurt is coming for you, baby. That's what he's saying. And he's testifying to the impulse in every human heart. We are all just waiting for the payback to come. And it's not just secular society. It's every worldview. It's every religion out there. It's ultimately, I do good, I get good, I do bad, I get bad. That's how this system works. That's the world we live in. But God is revealing a different kind of world to Abram. That's what he's doing here. This God, Abram, isn't like the gods you grew up with. He isn't like the moon god that would crush you if you didn't serve him right, didn't sacrifice right to him. That's not who this god is. When you belong to me, what's waiting for you on the other side of your worst failure is not payback. It's grace. It's grace. That's what you can count on. Abram, listen, Abram made a mess, but God made a promise. And God never breaks his promise, even when we make a mess. God always keeps his promise. And for some of you, this is, you live in a world of payback. Your your whole universe is this system that entirely depends on your performance. So when you fail, it crushes you and decimates you because you think everything's ruined. There's no coming back from this. And if it all depended on you, you'd be right. But in this awesome upside down economy of God, Life and relationship with him means his love for you doesn't depend on your performance. It depends on his performance for you. This is the gospel. This is, this is the big E on the I chart, guys. This is what it's all about. Paul says it like this in Romans 5. For while we were still awesome, no, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person. Though for perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God gives grace to undeserving people, doesn't he? 
God gives grace to undeserving people. And look, unless you're new to this whole Christianity thing, this should not be new or surprising to you. It should be your treasure. It should be your delight, but this should not be new news to you. This is what our God does. He loves to pour out his grace on failures and scared cowards like you and I. God gives grace to undeserving people. Now that might not be surprising to you, but here's something that may be. What I find surprising about all this is, I was studying this week, do you know what's surprising about this grace that we're looking at? That, that Pharaoh's name would be on the screen instead of Abram's? Do you know what's surprising about this grace? You would think that when God basically totally lets Abram off the hook, and not only that, but like dumps blessing on him as he exits Egypt, you would think that after all of Abram's sin, when God just showers blessing on him, you would think that what Abram's lesson would be, what, what, what his takeaway would be is, this is awesome. I just do whatever I want. And it's just, I just sell my wife whenever. I get more stuff. This is great. You would think that that would be the lesson that his heart learned from it. But that's exactly the opposite lesson from what Abram learns in the text. That's because grace doesn't just, listen, it doesn't just bless people, it changes people. Grace doesn't just give you something, it reforms something in you. Grace brings us home. That's what grace does. So look at verse 1 of chapter 13. He says this. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. And he journeyed up from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Between Bethel and Ai. To the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. Did you hear that language? This is, this is not just a geography lesson from Moses. This is not just telling us how Abram left Egypt and on what path he took. This is pilgrimage language. The author is trying to show us that after all of his straying, after all of his rebellion and self-preservation, after all of his cowardice and terrible decision-making, suddenly, out of the blue, Abram has this reformation and becomes a God worshiper again. He's, he's back at the altar where he was worshiping God at the last place before he took this turn with the famine. He's back at the altar glorifying God. He's back to the last place he encountered the living God. And the question you should be feeling is this. What got you back home? How did, how did he make it back home? What got him there? Was it God's wrath? Was it God slapping him around a little bit? Waking him up? Then getting him back? That's not what the text shows us. The text shows us it was not God's wrath that got him home. God's grace got him home. That's what brought him back. We are being, guys, please don't miss this. We are being told the secret to living a changed life. Do you want to know, ha have you gone too far? Like, are you in a place where you're like, never thought you'd be, and here you are, and what do I do? Like, what, in what way am I ever going to get back on the right path again? Do you, do you know how to get back home? Do you want to know how to walk in faith instead of fear? How those things take place? The answer, according to this passage, is not God smacking you around. That's not what the text says. The answer this passage gives is, it is his grace. Grace gets us back home. And this is what the scripture testifies to all over the place. Think of the book of Titus in the New Testament. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. There's the blessing. God is blessing us in grace. Bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So grace functions to bless me and then call me to holiness. Grace has a blessing function and an instructional function. Uh, Romans 2 says it like this. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. What leads me back to repentance? What gets me back into a life committed to the glory of God? Is it him 
pushing his thumb down on me. It's making me feel like trash. That's, that's the script so many of us have. Don't act like you don't. The text says it's his kindness. It's when he comes to you with a soft heart and mercy. It's when he says, come in my arms. Seriously, come here. Come here. I love you. Come here. That actually returns a wayward heart every time. When you truly meet God's grace, you will begin to love God's path again. That's how he gets us home. Jean Valjean in Les Mis, if you guys know the story. Jean is a thief who has been paroled and he's out on his own now and nobody will touch him with a 10 foot pole except this priest who takes him into his home. And even then, John doesn't get the clue yet. And so he ends up robbing from the priest, stealing a bunch of his silver and taking off that night. The police catch him. They bring him back to the priest's house and they bring him before the priest and they go, do you know this man? Is this your stuff? Did he steal from you? Do you remember what the priest says? He says, I do, I do know this man and that is my stuff. But he didn't steal it from me. No, 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 I, uh, I gave that to him. And in fact, friend, you left too soon because you forgot the candlesticks. And he goes and he brings more silver and he puts it in the bag and he blesses him and he sends him on his way. Remember what happens to Jean Valjean after that? Here's what he doesn't do. He doesn't go, this sucker, you kidding me? I'm just going to rob this guy blind every time now. He's just giving me his stuff. That's not what he does. What does he do when he collides with the grace of this man? His life becomes a life of grace. He goes home. He gets on the path of blessing others because he's been blessed. Now all of a sudden he's adopting orphans because he's experienced the grace of this man. Now all of a sudden he's looking out for the marginalized and serving the poor because of the grace he experienced that day. Now he's extending grace and mercy to his enemy throughout the story because he's tasted what it feels like to be the enemy and have grace come to him. This is what grace does. It doesn't just bless you. It changes you. God doesn't want to pay you back. He wants to bring you back. That's what he wants to do. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you feel like Abram. There's no way. There's not someone in this room that's going, I've made one decision too many away from God and I don't even see the path back. I'm just here this morning because, I don't know, this is a last ditch effort for me. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you felt like this, but I definitely have. And can I tell you, the invitation from this passage this morning is not to just wait for God to smoke you and just, and just resolve to go, well, this is how it goes. This is how my story ends. This isn't how the story ends. The story ends with God laying down his life on a Roman cross for your good. God becoming a curse taker, so he could bless you. The plagues don't come to our house when we're in Christ. They came to Christ's house on our behalf so that we can be with him. And that won't just make you happy. It won't just give you a shot in the arm. It will bring you back home. It will set you on the path to go back to righteous living, to God glorifying living. Grace, not wrath, is God means of changing our hearts forever. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for upsetting the paradigm that the whole world has told us to believe. That payback is the way it's going to be. You just didn't do it like that. You have upset the system it's a new economy. It's a different thing that you're doing. You use kindness to draw us in. And I'm so thankful. And for everybody in this room who's tasted your kindness, we know what a gift it is. God, would you keep us coming back to your kindness? Keep us drinking from the well of grace. Because this text tells me the only hope I have of wanting to go back to Bethel, the only hope I have of wanting to return to the house of God, to go back to the altar, to go bless his name again is if I meet the one who would send a plague elsewhere so that I could be blessed. God, change me. Change us. We thank you for grace. It's our only hope. We love you for it. We bless your name. Amen.